Hello everyone, Dr. Nicole LaPera, the holistic psychologist here. I am incredibly excited for this conversation that I'm getting ready to have with someone who has been a mentor for me in my, not only my own healing journey, but in my, in my clinical practice and shifting the way that I work entirely. So I'm here today with Kelly Brogan, um, and I am just beyond honored. You were the first person that I ever saw working holistically, trained conventionally. She's a medical doctor, came through more or less the same shoot of training that I have, but really turned my world upside down. So I'm beyond honored to have Dr. Brogan here today. Thank you for having a chat with me, Kelly. It feels so good to connect. I'm really excited to be here. Awesome. So you have an amazing new book out. Um, it's similar to a lot of the concepts that I talk about, really ground it with this idea. The word I often use is in empowerment. And a big part of the goal of what I'm doing online through this whole shift in the way that I work is to begin to give the humans out there tools to understand that they are well beyond capable of doing some very deep level healing. And the word that you use, and I love it so much, is, is reclamation or reclaiming. And that is the title of your new book. So tell us a little bit about kind of what your, I guess, mindset is on this whole concept of, of reclaiming the self. Yeah. So I think we share a, a mission. And I like to sort of encapsulate it by describing what I feel to be the importance of sharing information and educating around informed consent when it comes to uh, the dominant orthodoxy around treatment. So what are, we, what are we enculturated to believe is like the best, most effective treatment for any given um, illness or syndrome? And then also providing uh, people with the tools to heal in ways that they might not have been told was possible by that very system that makes those primary recommendations. And the reason I've come to this is, you know, as we do through my own health journey, through my own diagnosis of a chronic illness that I basically chose to listen to that small voice that said, no thanks, you know, to, to lifetime prescribing. I knew what conventional medicine had to offer. I could have written my own prescriptions and I just wanted a different way. And so I've committed myself, you know, as you have to, to really um, lighting that, that path. But I think we have this idea that kind of like getting, you know, I think we have this feeling, right? Like all of us right now that it's like time to level up. Like it's time to really show up in a different way to our problems and to orient around our life from a different perspective because the old way, the habitual way, the reflexive way is becoming more and more like bereft, unfulfilling, and maybe worse. Like maybe we're finding ourselves just with like one challenge after another, after another in this like morass of adversity. And I think we still imagine that the mandate is to like get it together and be in control and sort of like show up a boss, you know, in, in your life. And, and we think that that means like holding the mask on really tight and putting extra tape around it and, you know, strings and ropes and making sure it doesn't fall. Um, but I, I think that some of us are, are developing this sense and maybe the inner knowing that owning ourselves, that that kind of um, personal authority looks different than we might've imagined. And it involves uh, a kind of vulnerability. It involves breaking habits that maybe at one point had us feel um, comforted or strong or even safe, you know, and, and moving into these new territories, um, exploring what we were running from. And so, so you know, when I talk about illness and, and specifically around what's been labeled as mental illness, uh, I, I use this analogy like, you know, it's like if this scary man was like running after you, right? And, and you would do anything not to let him catch you, right? You jump off a cliff. But like, what if you just turn towards him and you were like, what do you want? And he's like, I got this letter for you that you absolutely need. It's like unlocking the secret to your existence, right? And you never would have known that if you just kept running. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a way of orienting around struggle, um, and crisis, and specifically as pertains to our health, that can really unlock an entire pathway towards um, self-ownership and 
and really engage the process of self-discovery because I think you would agree that's probably another definition of, of wellness, right, is engaging the process of self-discovery. We, we want to know about this, you know, we want to learn about this. And in conventional medicine, that's not even really something that figures in to the treatment plan, right? This concept mm -hmm. of, of, you know, sort of delving into the catacombs of what makes you you. It's just a matter of getting those annoying symptoms, dangerous symptoms, and yeah. inconvenient experiences like out of the picture. Yes, I, I could not agree more. I love that visual about wrapping, just trying to keep the mask on. And I, I couldn't agree more. I think that whether or not we're talking symptom management, physical or emotional symptoms, I think too many of us for far too long have been putting on an external brave face or medicating the symptoms or just trying to manage all of the surfaceness that's that we're living and and I lived this experience myself um, one of my biggest go-to coping mechanisms was dissociating so I say that to say that some of us I think get so distanced from our feelings and what's driving what's coming out all over the place in many different ways with then the focus being, okay, well, let's keep whatever is driving it really tucked away. It feels unsafe. It feels vulnerable. And let's just continue to try to soothe or medicate what's bursting out of the top. And quite honestly, I agree with you. I think people are, are, are done with that and intuitions are waking up. And I believe that a large reason that my, my Instagram has grown as, as exponentially as it has is that testament is that we're starting to realize that these, these band-aids just are no longer working. And I felt that in my own practice for a really long time. I felt the talk therapy model, the medication, the really two options that we were given in seven plus years of training, I felt that they were largely missing the underlying driving forces or driving symptoms of it. And I just think that we're ready. I love you view, your view is very similar to my own. I call our emotions teachers. They have incredible value for us, especially when we're finding ourselves up against the same type habitually, whether it's the anxieties or the depressions or the angers or whatever is driving it. There is meaning there. And I love that turning around and saying, okay, well, what is this? Let me understand what's really going on, whether it's in my physiological body or in these emotions that I never looked at, I felt too overwhelmed by. And I just, I love the way that you, you conceptualize it. And I, I could not agree more. And what I saw, the word I heard a million times a week, even in my old practice was stuck. Yes. The way I felt my whole life was stuck. So I really had to put a, a spotlight and start and try to understand. And that really was that niggle that I knew all along is we're all stuck because we're not looking at what's really causing it or driving these, these issues. Absolutely. And, you know, I would, I would add that I think most people who end up being captured by the medical system, whether it's psychiatrically or otherwise, have this momentary validation, right, that, that they are indeed broken. Right? Because I think so many of us walk around with this deep secret that we, we really – feel that something is wrong with us and we hope that we can paper that over so that nobody will notice and we'll never have to encounter you know that deep dark thought again so when the medical system says yes you do have a chemical imbalance yes you do have a an illness that runs in your family so take your medication and be a good patient there's some little part of us that says oh you see i knew i was messed up mm -hmm. right and and we don't understand what it is to then surrender our, our power to a system that labels us as such you know when you open that prescription bottle it has your name on it there is a subliminal messaging that says yep you can't fix this yourself you know you and every single day you're exposed to that and so a lot of what i think you know we're doing and and i my advocacy represents is just turning that on its head and not just for fun or to be controversial but really because i've witnessed firsthand that those who are labeled, and particularly those who are psychiatrically medicated, are some of the most exquisitely complex, sensitive, and even powerful individuals on this planet. And I've witnessed that over and over and over again, that once they are liberated, once they enter into their healing process, th these gifts emerge from them. Capacity 
that they have to magnetize um, light, you know, to their lives is so humbling. And it's something like, you know, what, what Krishnamurti says, that it's, it's no sign of health to be well adapted to a profoundly sick society. So is it possible that these individuals are through their symptoms, right? So whether it's poor concentration, sleep disturbance, you know, low energy, suicidality, you know, brain fog, whether it's, you know, all sorts of strange um, physical symptoms like hair loss and bloating and rashes and pain, or whether it's psychosis or symptoms of mania. Um, is it possible that they are expressing a very real imbalance and that's their signature means of expressing and responding to what is off, right? So that list of what's off right now is very long. And that's because I think you probably agree. I think we're at this like really incredible inflection point of, of shift, of collective change. And like the old model has run its course, it's served for a period of time, the old model of force and control and tamping down what feels scary. And now we're, we're being ushered into the new model, but we're kind of in the in-between, right? Mm -hmm. And so we need these, these individuals to begin to turn towards themselves, begin to develop self-mastery, and begin to express their gifts in a, in a way that, that serves the collective. Mm -hmm. Um, and serves their own healing, maybe even breaking lineage level cycles, right? How many of those who've been labeled mentally ill are the black sheep in their family? It's, it's almost to a person, right? And so might it be that they're here sensitive in the way that they are in order to learn how to wield that power in service of literally generations of, of trauma, dysfunction, and, and painful, you know, patterning. So, you know, I, I like to, when you, when you refer to kind of like what's driving it, um, if we're going to have the audacity to ask the question, you know, why is someone experiencing symptoms, you know, which is not a part of the rubric of conventional medical care. We don't ask why we just manage. Um, mm -hmm. And if we're going to ask why, you know, there are going to be as many reasons as there are individuals, right? Because mm -hmm. it's your narrative, it's your journey, it's your personal experience of, you know, d discovery. And that's why, you know, it's, it's interesting as a sidebar, like to a, a woman, the, the patients that I've treated when we complete treatment, because I think that should be the goal of any responsible practitioner's care, right? There should be a completion point where you, where you let them go. Um, they say, I finally feel like myself. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking the first like, couple times I heard that, I remember thinking like, why do you want to feel like yourself? <laughs> like, that doesn't sound like we accomplished much. Mm -hmm. and in fact, you know, because I thought, well, they want to feel strong and pretty and, you know, powerful or whatever. No, we just want to feel like we are inhabiting this skin properly, right? Like, like we know what to do with this. Like we have read the owner's manual of our personhood, right? And so, so it's, it's helped me to understand like, if that's the goal, how do we take the invitation of symptoms to begin to answer the question why, to understand how it fits into your narrative meaningfully? And so I, you know, I like to sort of like lay out um, an order of operations and that's not to say it's the only one, you know, there, there are obviously so many ways to, to engage your healing process, but I am a big proponent of, you know, beginning to, to really fortify the physical body um, and the heal the nervous system mm -hmm. so that you can have this liberated energy, this shift in perspective, um, that allows you to fully engage your toxic relationships, that job that's totally unfulfilling, all the elements of your daily lifestyle choices that are fundamentally at odds with what you on a soul level believe yourself to be entitled to, and maybe then begin to work with you know, childhood traumas and lineage level patterning of um, you know, pain. And so you know, if there's that kind of hierarchy um, then the beginning steps can be very basic. You know, sometimes you can be diagnosed with major depression or OCD or ADHD, let's say, 
and, or even schizophrenia, you know, and, and you can literally have gluten antigenicity or a B12 deficiency or hypothyroidism, or it could be a reaction to another medication, whether it's, you know, birth control pill or even an acid blocker or an antibiotic. And it could be blood sugar imbalance that's leading to your six panic attacks a day. Maybe you don't need to go on a massive heroine's journey, you know, into your spiritual catacombs. Maybe not. Maybe that's what your body was asking you to attend to. And it's so reversible in the space of weeks, you know, that, that why don't we start there with like what I call the low hanging fruit of engaging in this, um, self-care ritual that has the capacity to uh, reverse the symptoms of what might be chronic illness. I could not agree more. And I, nothing, something that always didn't sit really comfortably because what we do learn in school is this emphasis on the empirically validated, which when one way or another, the manualized treatment to study, you know, those that they're listening, the way scientific research happens is you need to have things universal enough to be studied. So the way that is, is things become manualized. CBT is the biggest manual, I think, treatment that we're taught. Not that something about that never really sat comfortably because I don't believe humans fit into a manual. I believe in the individualized nature because to speak to your point, and I, I conceptualize it similarly, sometimes some of the, the symptoms that we're experiencing are directly related to physiological imbalances. So for me, that was part of my story. And until I had my body in a much more balanced state with my nervous system included, because I had a, a lot of chronic, and this is something I often speak about, I think it's important to expand what we're typically taught as trauma, the big T, the, the glaring instances of abuse or neglect, because I didn't check necessarily those boxes. But emotionally, I had a completely absent mother chronically, a lot of anxiety and health related concerns in my family. So really simple, too big of feelings for a too little of a human that I was to cope with. So before I knew it, I did carry that nervous system overactivation that made it incredibly difficult for me to even dive into the deeper level of healing. So honestly, Kelly, it was when I heard one of your interviews speaking about these hormonal and physiological imbalances and blood sugar dysregulation that I had no idea about. We are the gut nutrition. This is not even spoken about in any program. I mean, I guess logically, why? Because we are very much still in a conventional system of separateness. Yep. Mind is separate from the body. So it makes sense that body is not touched. So you really introduced me to some lifestyle changes. I, I got my sleep in order. I changed the nutrition that I was eating. I, I really was able to gain physiological balance. And I don't believe that I would have been able to do the deeper level of the inner child work that I now have evolved yeah. into in my own healing journey without, and I think a lot of people listening are in that same boat. We're just so dysregulated physiologically, hormonally, or in our nervous system act overactivation of either of those, the parasympathetic or the sympathetic nervous system that we don't have that solid foundation, as I call it, to do the deeper work. Even more frustrating, and I, I would find that in more all, almost all, to be honest, of, of the clients that I that I worked with. And so for me, it wasn't until I really understood that interconnectedness and I addressed my low-hanging fruit, to use your language, that I wasn't able to progress into the deeper level of healing that I think a lot of us want to and need to do, but without that foundation, as I call it, I don't think it's possible. So I agree with you in terms of getting some basic systems back, maybe our body wants to be balanced. So sometimes it's a matter of removing yes. the activities or the things that are keeping us in balance um, before I think we can progress in our healing. Yeah, I call it like sending a signal of safety, right? So it's like this reset or, or, or reboot. And to your point, I mean, it, it's exactly, it's the good and bad news is that you're in control. Only you know what you need. There are myriad healing modalities out there. I mean, you can use homeopathy, essential oils, acupuncture, Reiki. I mean, it's an incredible time. The menu is huge, right? And you can allow yourself to be totally inundated and overwhelmed, confused, looking for that expert who's going to tell you what to do, or you can begin to cultivate a relationship with your inner compass. And when I first sort of came upon this concept of like 
self-guided healing. I was like, well, yeah, but how do you know? <laughs> right? Like, okay, nice idea. And now what do I do? So that's pretty much how I conceive of my offering is like, do not take it from me, right? I am not here to tell anybody how to heal. But what I have come upon is a ritual practice, a 30 day, you know, approach to, to getting you in touch with that. And I found it to be pretty effective. And I think for the reasons um, we're discussing, because it's simply a, a way based on self-care and simple lifestyle choices, you know, related to nutrition, related to detox, related to relaxation response, that you can calm your nervous system, shift into regenerative state that has itself, you know, a, a bioneurological signature that allows you to receive, interact, and respond in ways that you're simply not when you're in that chronic fight or flight um, state of, you know, neuroinflammation. And once you do that, things become clear. So that's pretty much what I have to offer, you know, is this one, it's like a portal. It's like a one month portal you go through and then you're ready. It's like you're, you're, you're in mastery mode because you are going to know exactly what you need. And I found, you know, from patients to participants in, you know, my online program, but on my reset that it's, you know, to a person, they, they commit, they choose this experience. And then what unfolds from there has nothing to do with me, literally, you know, other than that, perhaps I was in a you know, position to say, listen, it might be the case that nothing's wrong with you and your body doesn't make mistakes and it's been trying to get your attention. So how do you learn its language? How do you begin to dialogue with it in, in and through curiosity um, rather than, you know, reflexive fear, which is a natural response given, you know, the ways in which we've been enculturated by this society. Yeah, yeah I couldn't agree more. And something I talk about because I believe the result of whether, again, it's these hormonal imbalances that are keeping us out of sync, the societal message that we're given I think we become the adults that don't trust ourselves, our intuition and our body. And I think the work that I do with my own clients as well is one of reconnecting with that intuition, that authentic self that's down below has always been there. As yes. far as I say it, I will always describe, I don't know how you believe we get to this planet, but upon arrival, I use two adjectives all the time because I believe this to be true. We're intuitive. We have that intuition, that internal guidance, and we're adaptive. Yes. And I think what happens that a lot of times, whether it's our immediate caregiving environment, school systems and messages, society at large, over time, we become disconnected from our intuition and distrustful of it. I talk a lot about caregivers who often have no ill intention of their own, but who who diminish or invalidate our perception. That intuitive sense that we as little children have we're put in an experience after experience where, and because we're in a dependent state, we forsake yeah. our reality for the people that we need to be bonded to and connected with, not only for our physical needs, but for those universal interpersonal needs that I believe we all have and share as humans. So before we know it, we're an adult who is either so disconnected from ourself and our intuition that we don't quote unquote, hear it speak and or we don't trust what we hear. So I think what drives a lot of the deeper and the empowerment of this sort of journey is, and the language that I think was so beautiful that your clients would, would offer is feeling like myself. Mm -hmm. And I think it is ultimately our journey back to that self that has just been so conditioned and invalidated away by the time that we get to adulthoods that the question I get so often is how do I know it's my intuition? How do I know if I can trust it? And I think that's the journey that we then spend once we take that pivot and begin to heal is back to ourself that was authentically challenged in one way or another. Yes. And I think the medical system and its dominance in our, our psyches, you know, not, not to mention the, the, the role of the pharmaceutical industry in messaging to us about our biology, right? So we are one of three countries in the world that allows industry to speak to consumers directly through advertisement. And so we're just bathing in these memes about what's wrong with us and how we need an external authority to help us to understand. But really, it's not a facilitation. It's not really helping. 
it's like a top down you know objectification when you go to a doctor whether that's an obgyn or a psychiatrist or, or whatever it might be you're going to them as the authority on you and it's, it sounds to most of us obviously yeah of course i am i want the answer but we have to start to consider what is in, in what does that entail right what are we empowering them with that that is costing us a certain degree of empowerment and in fact can we learn about the significance of what we're experiencing perhaps on our own with some support right it's a different model and through through this model you know we really resolve a childlike consciousness a consciousness that that um perceives authority figures whether whether it's the government, the FDA, or your internist, mm -hmm. as having um, you know the, the final word on your experience, whereas an adult consciousness would you know certainly represent what you're describing, where that locus of control is is inside and it's not changeable and you know moving in the wind <laughs> depending, on, depending on what other people are um, describing to be your state. You have a connection to that signature essence. Uh, within you and it takes time absolutely takes time you know these days when I uh, you know I think you would probably use the same language like self-abandon right or self-violate there's a signature feeling to that you know it's like and I get defensive about it inside myself it's like my little attorney inside myself is like at the stand ready to defend unnecessarily because no one even said anything <laughs> my choice right like the way that I micro lied or the way that I represented something incompletely or the way that I said something to my daughter that I didn't need to you know and and so you begin to learn your biological signature does your heart race do you tense up do you sweat a little do you feel like you you need a you know a drink or a candy bar or you know it, what is your um what is your signature? Your doctor can't tell you that. Your doctor can't tell you that. And so that seems intuitive in the realm of our emotional terrain and personalities and, and psychic structures, but it's really not different in the, in the realm of, of biology. You know, even in, in seemingly reified um, institutional medicine, you know, when it comes to heart disease and cancer and diabetes and autoimmune conditions. I mean, you can find, I can help you find, you know, we're constantly at the, at the desk trying to publish these outcomes of people who reclaim their health, no doctor involved, right? Or very minimal guidance from a doctor. So how do you explain that if the doctor is the final authority? Mm -hmm. We're entering yeah. a new realm. Yeah. Yeah. And and I think it's really exciting, Kelly, and I think some of it is generational, too, because I look back at my parents, my mother, who has been chronically ill my entire life, and they're in their 80s now. So they, I believe, are of a generation where the doctor was seen as authority, and furthermore, where the world of the internet and exchange of information did not exist. So unless you're going to be the person who's getting multiple opinions, you do have that mindset, okay, so whoever is wearing the white coat, they bequeath to me what it is or what it isn't, and here are my options. And I don't think that they had very much, I mean, some really industrious, I'm sure could have gotten multiple opinions, maybe dove into some textbooks, but I believe we're in an era now with a free energy exchange that you can actually go on and empower yourself with opinions outside of one doctor's own that's something else that never really sat comfortably with me, with, which is this idea that I am in the room as the expert that holds the actual pieces of the puzzle. Even with the clients I work with now, I say, that's don't look to me. Do not do exactly what I do. I, I, I su highly suggest you don't. Yeah. I highly suggest you, you know, do exactly what you're, you're offering, which is discover you. I am a big proponent of developing what I call self-observation. So the ability to objectively, you know, explore and view yourself throughout the day so you can know what your cues are, know what your trigger points are, know how emotions begin to take hold in your body and then what value that they could offer of you. And I think I love that visual you gave her okay so this is what this professional said this is what it must be and my partner and I talk about this a lot because we observe that a lot of people I call it reactive they're living in a very reactive state where they are either 
taking everyone else's opinion and doing, or they're just reacting emotionally to each and every one of the occurrences in their given day. So you'll always hear me speak of shifting from that internalizing that control, that locus of control that you're speaking of so that we can develop choice and responsiveness. So we can take in all of the information, but then as I say it, we go back and we try it on for size, knowing that ultimately I am the person who knows if this fits or if this doesn't fit. Because not all of the information that we're getting from people is helpful, is accurate, or is about us at all. Like you're saying, all of this internal workings, I could be responding to or reacting to something in a given moment that was not even about me. That was an offhanded comment that this person said about something that I triggered in them. And now I'm having my own work up emotionally about something that's not about me. And I think until we develop that home base, we're going to feel very reactive and very out of control in this world and not very empowered. Totally. And, and even the etymology, I, I love to sort of visit with sometimes, right? Because like reactive is, is repeating of a past patterning. And, and so many of us are obviously living. In fact, I think it's Van der Kolk who defines trauma as like, you know, living um, the present as a repeat of the past. And that's why we see the same patterns over and over and over again. And we're victimized in the same way, you know, over and over and over again. And this concept of taking personal responsibility, right? So anytime you have that trigger, how can it not be a new victim story? How can it be an opportunity for responsibility that, you know, if you just break it apart, it's response ability. Like how can you cultivate the capacity to respond rather than react? And I think, you know, there are some pretty basic ways to begin to pave that, that path, but it might start with, first of all, awareness. So again, in the realm of informed consent and this democratization of information through the internet, um, you know, we are in a position to consent ourselves, really, you know, because if you go to a doctor and you're prescribed anything from you know, uh, uh, an antibiotic for a cough to, you know, a, a steroid or whatever, your doctor is going to tell you what your doctor has been taught. Trust me, when I used to prescribe, including to pregnant and breastfeeding women, as a specialist in that interesting arena, I thought I knew what I needed to know, you know, and I had very good intentions, right? So these are not bad people doing bad things. <laughs> They have a limited scope, and I, I describe it as like, you know, you wouldn't go to the butcher to learn about veganism. So how are you going to learn about veganism? You're going to source information from other places, right? And so if we're looking at informed consent, we have to know about the risks that perhaps your doctor is not told about, you know, so particularly, let's say, the, the dependency um, forming nature of these medications and how challenging it can be without proper support to come off of psychiatric medication. So you're not gonna learn about that from your doctor. And you're not gonna learn about potentially how the benefits are overplayed and overpromised because of a small keyhole of the literature that they are you know, encouraged to look through. You're certainly not gonna learn about alternatives, right? So what is alternative? You know, I, I'm very interested in the fact that some of the outcomes I've had, um, you know, the, the privilege to witness whether it's you know chronic recidivistic treatment resistant schizophrenia, suicidal depression, bipolar disorder on the way to you know state hospital, whether it's OCD or whether it's like you know grief after a loss, that these individuals for the most part were either injured by or not helped by, in some cases kind of left by the side of the road in the treatment resistant category by the conventional system, right? So, so this is not only something that is like potentially as good, quote unquote, um, with fewer side effects, it's actually a realm of, of outcomes that are not available within the system, that are literally not available. And so whether you wanna call that remission or cure or radical healing, that is not a concept in the chronic um, illness realm of conventional medicine. That's what makes it chronic. Nobody's trying to resolve it or cure it or heal it. So if you know that that's possible, and that's a big part of my advocacy is just making sure people know what's possible, then a little, a little, you know, spark might ignite in you that says, yeah, I want that. And you're going to know exactly what you're going to be attracted to what you need to do 
to make that a reality for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And I like particularly that you do speak so strongly about informed consent, because what I hear when you say that is you're not saying do or don't do one thing or the other. You're actually just saying, equip yourself with the whole of it, with all yeah. of the knowledge so that then you for yourself can make the most empowered choice. Because for some people, maybe that is be continuing down that conventional system in one way or another. I know for my family, it is, and it will always be. For yeah. others though, that spark might be lit enough. So I, I love that that's your mindset because with information, we do equip ourselves, or at least give ourselves the opportunity to begin to make new choices. And I, and I think that there are people out there, you know, this is one of the, the main way I'm using my platform is to show communities a big motivator for me outside of starting to talk about these new holistic methods that I, I knew were going to be really helpful and to start to give tools to humanity in a sense. Another really big motivator for me, Kelly, was to discover other humans who were experiencing the same things because it can be really lonely and isolating because the reality is people around us are still going to be marching down that conventional system or just making daily lifestyle choices that I don't choose to make for myself anymore. So big, I went online and I thought, okay, there have to be other people in this world. And my mind is blown daily with how many other people are living and can share their experiences and community is healing. And, and I think that now that the collective is waking up, there are more people that understand that there are alternate ways of healing. And I just like that we are putting the message out there and allowing the communities of these people to find each other. So now it's of people I don't even contact with. I'm seeing relationships developing comments and you know, that makes, that just warms my heart. And I'm like, okay, this is, these are other humans that get it. We're not, I'm not for everyone. I understand that, but I do think that the more information, at least you're setting people up to make empowered choices. And I like to just highlight that because that's all you're, that's what you're speaking for. And I could not agree more because I know I wasn't given information. I was down that standard path because that's all I thought that was available. And to speak to your point, we only know what we're told or what we're taught. So now you have other people out there that are sending different messages. And I'm just, I'm just, I'm excited to see, continue to see the trajectory, I think of this, of this big shift. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's interesting because when I wrote my first book, A Mind of Your Own, I thought, oh, well, once somebody has this information, then obviously they're never going to touch a medication, right? Mm -hmm. I was, you know, slowly disabused of that assumption mm -hmm. because like your family and like so many people that I know, like my own family, <laughs> that's not the case. Information is not sufficient to change minds. So, so what I think is happening, it's like, you know, folks like you and me, it's like we're, we're howling up into the, into the you know, stratosphere and people are hearing that. And then the information is kind of like, uh, it's like the pebbles on, you know, the, on the moonlit path, you know, but it's, it's not the information that changes anyone's mind. And I've learned that the hard way trying to convince people that in fact, not everyone is called to this process and, and path. And it's, it's something like we're just organizing around different resonances, you know, like I have a, a, a community vital life project for people who like don't want to take the deep dive into the protocol yet, but they need to warm up and they want to take like little steps. And I, and I have witnessed like that if all we do in that community is practice um, expressive and narrative hygiene around victimization, right? Like we talk about our experience of symptoms and our, our challenges through the lens of personal empowerment, then we are committing to a shared vision and, and goal. And that's what brings us together. Like that's the resonant frequency that we're occupying. And I am recognizing like, it's kind of like I had this thought the other day, like in these little communities, when you feel like, yes, like they get me, they get what I'm talking about. Even if you're, you're not doing the stuff, you're not reading the books, but just something in you is like, yeah, that's a more beautiful life. I want to be a part of that, right? It's like we're organizing around like different tissue structures and cellular lines. Like, you know, like there's the liver cells and the heart cells and the kidney cells and all together we make an organism, but we're not all of the same resonant frequency. And so I think that's like 
what's happening? It's like, we're kind of like finding our organs. <laughs> like, yeah. Uh -huh. weird tissues and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and you'll know, you know, what that, what that signature is. It's probably not going to come through the vector of information, which is frustrating for me because I love that there's so much science to support, you know, this, this new approach to the body and, you know, this, this interconnectedness that you're, mm -hmm. you're describing. I mean, there's literally two and a half decades of research into psychoneuroimmunology that tell the story of the validity of this, that it is real and maybe more real than, than the science and medicine that's currently being practiced, but it's just there to kind of support us. It's not there to, to, uh, you know, change anyone's mind. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. And I, I joke often and I say, my hope is, I guess I should say that I, I believe that this time in history is going to be looked back upon from a much more evolved place where epigenetics is actually the science that we all adhere to, where we do understand this in interconnectedness and words like psychoneuroimmunology are very well. I, I, and I think that we're going to be viewed as the end of dark ages. I just think it's inevitable when that happens, um, you know, question mark, but it's happening. So I know you do have, tell us a little bit about, you know, if anyone is interested and in, got a kernel lit or a spark from this conversation. I know you have an amazing community at, at Vital Life and a new book coming out. So where can people find you and find other like-minded individuals if, if they have, you know, something that's sparked up inside of them after the conversation today? Awesome. Yeah, I mean, I've been I've been at this for you know I don't know ten or so years, beginning with my own healing journey, and I I feel a bit um, of like a mic drop moment because I feel like I've I've created the offerings that are necessary um, for self healing and publish you know science to support their efficacy and have testimonial videos of people healing from all sorts of things they were told they couldn't heal from. And so the, you know, the offerings range from like a low cost month to month membership where we do this little step by step stuff called Vital Life Project to the deep dive. It's kind of like that's the yin space. The deep dive is the yang space of Vital Mind Reset, which is like when you're ready for that month and you're ready to potentially move through the dark night of your soul's healing, you know, that's what, you know, we've built up. And then there's kind of like, you know, books that match those, right? So my newest book is really more meant for the long haul process of um, awakening, you know, and how to stay strong primarily from um, the perspective of not engaging the medical system from a place of fear, right? So with, you know, there's tips on it, everything from how to work with the UTI, UTI symptoms naturally to, you know, how to engage suicidality. And it, my goal is really to, to have created a toolkit that will keep um, people from engaging the system when it's not right for them uh, because they might imagine they don't know what else to do. So here's what else to do. Um, and it's called Own Yourself. And it's something of a sequel to A Mind of Your Own, which was the, the first book was much more, on deconstructing psychiatry and and I don't know kind of some of the myths that we might have been exposed to the protocol in there has been refined and um, I was sitting with my partner yesterday he's reading my book actually now for the first time and he's like wow you're really giving away the goods on the protocol huh and it's true you know we decided to just put it all in own yourself because um, people can do it from a book. Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't be able to, but people can, and we've seen that. And now that I see that, I feel like have at it, you know, here's yeah. all you need, here's all you need to know. And some, you know, sort of tips and, and tricks from the trenches and, and we'll, you know, we'll see how ready people are. It's, it's really my creative wave, you know, that will um, begin to, to shift this for all yeah. of us, for all of our sake. Yeah, I think it's incredible. And I think having the community offering with the book coming out to speak to your point and the reality that maybe these are people who are in versions of treatment. That's what I believe very strongly about my work too. It doesn't have to be standalone. Go see your therapist, go get support. Please go use all the tools and resources. Here's another addition. Here's some helpful toolkit and to speak to the point your your first book honestly so anyone listening who has not read a mind of her own this was for me it was really pivotal you did introduce me to a whole world of science 
that I had not learned about um, and I needed to. And that was my really jump off point to then dive a bit deeper and really inform myself for my own healing that I was going through very actively, but the the ultimate, the clinical work that I'm doing. And those listening, I did get eyes on her new book and I'm about halfway through because I can't put it down and it's just amazing. So you are equipping humanity in such a, a pivotal way, Kelly. And like I said, you've always been a mentor from afar. So today getting to chat with you is, and seeing just continued alignment in our work is, is everything to me. So I just want to wholeheartedly thank you and anyone out there listening, she knows what, she, what she's doing, go jump in her community too, um, and really give yourself more of a toolkit. And I, I'm just, I'm excited. Like I said, I think this is a testament to the times that people like you and I exist and are, you know, have a following and have other humans out there. Anyone listening, I've, I've definitely watched many of the testimonial that you've put up. Um, go get yourself some empowerment. Someone listening that maybe has a spark, jump on, see that there is so much possible, and then come join our community. So thank you. I, you've been really, really pivotal beyond what you can imagine. Thank you. No, it's, it's, it's an honor. And I find myself wondering if, if this book own yourself is like something like a mind of your own plus your work. And like now that I'm reflecting on it, like there really is so much um, overlap. And, and I, I think, you know, we're in an exciting moment and those who are called to their higher, more powerful expression, you know, the tools are there, the support is there and uh, you deserve it. Absolutely. Well, thank you for taking the time. Thank you.